Good afternoon and welcome to today's special event. Hi, my name is John Beacom and I'm representing Physics and Astronomy on behalf of a larger Science Sundays Committee from the College of Arts and Sciences. The College of Arts and Sciences, which also covers humanities of course, seeks to expand the boundaries of knowledge, to understand the implications for our complex society and to nurture creative expression. A core part of our mission is not to share these what we find not just with students, but with the broader public. Hence the importance of the Science Sundays lecture series, of which is a monthly series, which you can sign up for according to the webpage there. Today, we're partnering with the Center for RNA Biology, and I ask Corrine to introduce them. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, my name is Kareem Muser Forsyth, and I'm the uh, current director of the Center for RNA Biology. We are a group of about 40 or 50 research groups from all around the university, and we focus on RNA biology, all aspects. We also have a teaching and outreach mission, which is part of why we're partnering with this uh, Science Sundays today. And we have um, been in existence as an official university center since 2012. Our, um, this is also part of the Schoenberg Lectureship, and this is named in honor of Dan, uh, Dr. Daniel Schoenberg, who was the um, founding director of the Center for RNA Biology, and has really been a cheerleader and advocate for RNA biology for decades um, on campus. He's now a professor emeritus, and you'll hear from him in a little bit. After the lectures today, uh, or sorry, toward the end, not in a little bit. <laughs> After the lectures today, we have um, some of our RNA Center trainees who have been working really hard to prepare posters um, so that they can share with you the exciting research that's going on in the research labs here at OSU. So I hope that afterward, you'll be able to stroll through the posters, get some refreshments, and talk to our trainees. So now I'd like to introduce Dr. Amrit Singh, a professor from molecular genetics, who will introduce the main event. Thank you, Kareen. <clears throat> Thank you all for coming. Um, so it's my very special pleasure to introduce our guest speaker here today, Dr. Melissa Moore, who is a distinguished scientist and as some of you may know, I had a privilege work, to work with her and have her as my mentor. So Dr. Moore started working on RNA uh, at MIT soon after her getting her PhD from MIT. So she started working with Nobel laureate Dr. Philip Sharp and her work revealed uh, the chemistry behind how RNA segments get joined in our cells. One defining thread throughout Dr. Moore's career is that she's always looking for uh, big challenges, new challenges. And very appropriately for a large part of her academic career, her lab was supported by Howard Hughes Medical Institute, which was founded by uh, the famous aviator. And that institute supports scientists who take big risks to uh, solve big uh, outstanding problems. And her lab went on to make several fundamental discoveries, including how RNAs are made, how RNAs are quality checked in our cells, and how RNAs are degraded. Her interest to keep looking for new challenges took her lab to make cute key discoveries in how RNA functions in neurons, in uh, neurodegenerative disorders, and many other areas. And for of, for her enormous contributions throughout her career, uh, she has been recognized by several awards, uh, including the uh, Lifetime, Lifetime Achievement Award from the RNA Society and election to National Academy of Sciences. In 2016, Dr. Moore surprised a uh, lot of us in academic circles when she decided to join this relatively little known company called Moderna. <laughs> and, and at the time she said, it's, it, it is time to use RNA as medicines. And, and you know, we, we, we can now see, we all know, uh, you, you know what uh, potential that had and Moderna has become a household name. She's continued, uh, she has continued to look for new challenges. She has launched uh, uh, multiple companies, including one th that is developing therapy for a pregnancy-related disorder called preeclampsia. So indeed, through work uh, of a visionary like, uh, like Dr. Moore and through the progress in the RNA field, we are indeed entering a an era uh, where, where we can uh, develop medicines 
um, that follow the language of life. Uh, so please join me in welcoming Dr. Moore as she leads us to the dawning age of RNA medicines. Wow, thank you, Amrit. That was like the best introduction ever. Um, hello, I just need to boot up my, here we go. Uh, let's see, there, get, yep, there we go. All right, well, thank you for coming today and also I wanna thank uh, the um, organizers and, and leaders of the RNA Center and Dan and Kareen and Anita and Amrit for inviting me. Um, I retired in March, and I'm not giving very many lectures anymore. In fact, I said I wouldn't give lectures, but Amrit was so insistent that uh, uh, I said, okay, fine. Um, and it's so nice to be back here. I've, I've come to OSU uh, multiple times over the years, and it's a really wonderful uh, community. So what I wanted to talk to you about today uh, is, as Amrit said, the dawning age of RNA medicines. And where I think we should start is just thinking about what, what is a medicine? And most of us, especially those of us who are older, uh, probably you know, take a handful of pills every day. Um, and so that's what we're mostly familiar with. And, but a medication is something to diagnose, cure, or treat, or prevent disease. Now, the pills that are in this person's hand, by and large, those are what are called small molecule medicines. So what do I mean about small molecule medicines? So some of the fir very first small molecule medicines were antibiotics like penicillin or prontosil, which is a sulfa drug. Um, and you can see they, were, they were actually weren't discovered until the 1920s, 1930s, not even 100 years ago. So it's amazing to think how far we've come in under 100 years. Now, of course, since then, there have been hundreds and thousands of other small molecule medicines, uh, including things like ibuprofen, Prozac, uh, Lipitor, uh, you know, I could name, go ahead and, and name many, many, many others. Now, these small molecule medicines are uh, really uh, useful because they're generally stable in pill form. You can generally take them uh, orally. Um, but how do they work? How, what, what is it they do? Well, by and large, almost all small molecule medicines target proteins. So if we look at this um, uh, um, graphic from the protein database, uh, the small molecule medicines are the little molecules that are in that vial there. And uh, it's showing them binding to, to uh, things that are colored um, here. And these are proteins. And so the way that small molecule medicines work is that they uh, by and large, modulate the activity of proteins. Now, you might think, and especially the kids in the audience, I know there's a couple, that you, know, you might generally think of protein as something that's you know, important to have in your diet or and for the kids, something your parents are teaching, wanting you to eat all these things because they're protein-rich foods, right? But your body uh, is actually about 15% of your body weight is protein. Uh, so it's an important part of your body. But it's, protein is, is not monolithic. I mean, that, that term is, is very general. It turns out that there are many, many proteins in our body. Let me just give you uh, examples of a few. So, for example, the collagen in your skin that makes your skin pliable but tough is a protein. And each one of those uh, little different colors is a different molecule of collagen. Um, they're the, what say, enables you to move, actin and myosin, those are proteins. Uh, your blood contains lots and lots of hemoglobin, which is what carries uh, oxygen around. M antibodies that protect us from disease. And clotting factors that help us close up our wounds, to just name a few. But um, you're, you're the, in some total, all of the proteins in your body, that's called the proteome, uh, there's over 100,000 different kinds of proteins that your body makes. Now, it's hard to imagine. I, I want you to, to imagine at a small scale. So one of the things I want you to do is reach up and feel your hair. Just take, feel a hair, right? All right, now, pro, each protein molecule, each one of these proteins is 1,000th the width of your human hair. They're really tiny. 
So that's how we can fit all of this stuff into our bodies, because these things are really, really small. And so the number of, of num the, the number of individual protein molecules in your body is astounding. Um, you have in your body over 30 trillion cells. Uh, that's three with 13 zeros, it's a crazy number. And each one of those cells has between one billion and 10 billion protein molecules in it. So I'm not, I don't remember what the name for that big number is. But what I can tell you is that it's as many uh, stars as there are in the, in the universe is the number of protein molecules in your, in your body. So it's really, again, what I'll be talking about today is hard to imagine because it's at this microscopic scale. Uh, but there's just a tremendous amount of stuff going on uh, in your body all the time and making proteins. Now, I told you there's um, over 100,000 different proteins in your body. Now, one of the things that we think about, uh, we need to think about as sitting here, is homeostasis, so health. So, you know, when you're, when you're healthy, that means you have the right levels of all these different proteins, right? But um, when you have, uh, you can think of health and disease as the yin and yang or uh, of, of things. And uh, so that line in green is, is the homeostasis, so things are balanced. But there are many diseases that, uh, where there's, there's a, whoops, what's happening? Sorry. There are many diseases where um, either a protein is missing or you don't have enough of a particular protein. So examples of such diseases are type 1 diabetes, so people don't make enough insulin, which is a protein. Um, hemophilia, where uh, they have an inborn error, where they're not, they don't make a clotting factor, so they can't clot when they bleed. Or inborn metabolic errors, so this would be one of your metabolic enzymes. You can't digest your food properly, and there are over a thousand different uh, of these inborn metabolic errors, where there's a missing protein. There's other diseases where there's too much of a specific protein. So examples of these are uh, thrombophilia. That's the opposite of hemophilia. So thrombophilia is when people have too much clotting factors and they clot too easily. Um, very common in the Caucasian population, actually. Uh, amyloidosis, where uh, you form amyloid plaques depend because you have too much of a particular protein. And uh, as, as Amrit mentioned, uh, preeclampsia, which is caused by too much of a protein that's secreted by the placenta that makes mom sick. Um, and so it would be really nice if we could um, regulate these different diseases, not just by, by thinking about small molecules, but what about if we could, for example, when there's missing or not enough of a particular protein, what if we could give it back? So instead of making a small molecule that modulates a protein, just give the protein itself back. Because of course, these, these diseases that are caused by not enough or a missing protein, you can't have a small molecule that recognizes that protein because that protein is just not there, right? So it turns out um, over the last 100 years, proteins have become increasingly important as medicines. And so the very first protein that was used as a medicine was insulin. And I note that it was discovered just over 100 years ago. Uh, and obviously, it's a very important protein. Erythropoietin is uh, given to patients that need to make more red blood cells. Um, monoclonal antibodies, I'll talk a lot more about those in a minute. Uh, and then uh, factor eight is one of the factors that's missing for hemophiliacs. And so this is a protein that is given uh, to hemophiliacs. And what you can sh see here is I'm showing the structures of these proteins at the atomic level. So each one of those little balls on the structure, that bumpy structure, is an atom. And so proteins are made of atoms, uh, and this is really what they look like at the atomic level. Now let's talk about monoclonal antibodies for a bit. Now you, I'm sure you've all heard about monoclonal antibodies during COVID because it was one of the ways that um, if you got COVID, you could uh, get monoclonal antibodies to, uh, to, to treat COVID. 
Now, monoclonal antibodies have turned out to be incredibly useful uh, medicines. And you can see here, this is a, a paper from uh, 2021 in Nature that was celebrating the FDA approving the 100th monoclonal antibody product. Uh, the first monoclonal antibody that was approved was in uh, 1986. Uh, and then uh, you can just see the, the up and to the right curve. Uh, there's many, many, and in, actually in, in 2020, there was something like 160 monoclonal antibodies in clinical trials. So uh, there are many, many coming more. Now, if we uh, also think about, uh, for those of you who watch evening TV and you're constantly bombarded with uh, commercials, you'll recognize some of these names. Uh, and so these were, in 2020, the top pharma, the top grossing uh, pharma drugs with Humira at the top. Um, and so you can just, uh, I'm sure you recognize a bunch of these. I think I, I've heard um, advertisements for all of them. But if we instead uh, take away the names of the drugs and ask, well, what kind of drug are they? Uh, in fact, over two thirds of them were proteins. So uh, really these, they have become, proteins have become inc incredibly important uh, medicines. Now, even though proteins are incredibly important medicines, one problem is they're, they're quite expensive. Uh, that's why they make so much money, right? Um, but the other problem, there's a number of, of drawbacks. One problem is with proteins, uh, using proteins as medicines. So these are, these are proteins that are grown in, in large so-called bioreactors. These are, these are very large, uh, um, uh, how do I say it, a, a reactor that, that in which you grow tissue culture cells, usually Chinese hamster ovary cells that have been, uh, uh, have been modified so that they express that particular protein and then they're purified. And so it's just a really large dedicated industrial infrastructure. Another problem is that once the protein is uh, purified, they are each unique, so they have to be, the, the drug companies have to go through lots and lots of, of work to figure out, well, how do we formulate it? How do we stabilize it? How do we, what's the best way to give it? And it, each one is different, right? Uh, and then another thing is that proteins, just like, are often decorated with what are so-called uh, post-translational modifications. So they, they are decorated with sugar molecules. And if you make a protein in, let's say, a hamster cell, um, it's not gonna have the same decoration pattern as the human protein, so it's not quite the same. But um, the, the ultimate limitation of uh, proteins, protein biologics as we so call them, is that they have to be delivered extracellularly, meaning that um, they are made outside the body, purified, and then they're delivered by injection into the body. So they have to work outside of your cells. So very few of these proteins that are made outside the body and injected can get into cells. They have to work in the bloodstream. But the problem is that over 90% of those 100,000 proteins that I told you about are actually inside cells or you know, on the cell surface. And so we cannot make those proteins outside the body and use them as drugs because they have to, be, to get inside our cells in order to work. So that's a problem. So how can we overcome that? Well, now we need to talk about something called the central dogma of biology. And this is um, where I spent my uh, career working uh, as, a, as a basic researcher. Uh, the central dogma of biology says that proteins, which I've been showing you these folded structures here, um, are really, they start out as these long strings of, of amino acids. So they're basically long necklaces that fold up into a three-dimensional shape, and it's that three-dimensional shape that gives them their function. Now the instructions to, um, for the, to, to build a, a protein, to what order these amino acids go in, come in the form of messenger RNA. Uh, and messenger RNA is a so-called nucleic acid. Um, and it, messenger RNA, is a temporary copy of the instructions that are in your genome, so that, that are in the DNA in your, your nucleus. So the way cells make all these different proteins is that when a cell needs to make a particular protein, it copies the 
so the little set of instructions from the DNA into mRNA, that mRNA goes out of the nucleus into the cytoplasm where it is translated um, into proteins. And the reason this is, called, this is called transcription because you're, it's a copy, you're going from, from DNA to RNA. But translation because you're, this is the language of nucleic acids. This is a different language. This is the language of amino acids. And this translation process happens by these little machines called ribosomes. Um, and ribosomes run along the RNA, the mRNA, and they uh, spit out the proteins dependent on what the instruction set here is on that mRNA. Okay. So one of the things to just know, so remember I told you how many protein molecules are in your body. All those proteins, you, your body makes them. When you eat protein-rich diet, your body breaks down the proteins into the amino acids and then rebuilds those proteins. So our, our bodies are incredible protein factories. We make uh, all those molecules of proteins ourselves. And our cells so, uh, are just chock full of mRNA and these ribosomes, these protein factories. Uh, and so as I told you before, a typical human cell, let's say it has three billion protein molecules, uh, it has about 30, I mean, 3 million of these ribosomes, these little protein factories, and about 300,000 of these mRNA molecules. And remember, I told you, you have over 30 trillion cells in your body. So, um, and I told you that your body is, uh, about 15% of your body weight is protein. But what that means is that when you eat protein-rich foods, you're not only eating lots of protein, you're also eating lots of RNA. Now I'm gonna tell you a little bit later that mRNA is not the only kind of RNA, and you're eating lots of RNA. But my point of this slide um, is that when you make medicines out of messenger RNA, we're not giving you something that is foreign to your body. Your body is making mRNA all the time. We're just, we've just finally figured out how to make it outside the body and give it to your body so that your body can then use that to make proteins. So, but the next time you go and, and if we go out here and, and have some refreshments later and you eat a carrot or you eat some broccoli, just note you're eating lots of RNA. So you're taking it in all the time. Now, let's think about those, those small molecule medicines again. Um, and let's think about what are the characteristics that make for a, a classic medicine, a good medicine. So, um, Typical uh, medicines, there's three attributes of classic medicines. They have a limited duration of effect. This is a good thing, because if you had a side effect from the medicine, then you can just stop taking it, right? Um, but you might have to take it every four hours in the case of ibuprofen or something like that. Um, they have predictable dose-dependent effects. So if, uh, and, and anybody who has taken um, Antidepressants, for example, you'll know that you start at a lower dose and you go up until you get to an efficacious dose. So um, you get a dose-dependent effect. And um, you can redose them. So you can take them over and over and over again and get the same effect. Now, what about mRNA and proteins? Is that also true? Because if, if we're going to use them as medicines, then these three characteristics should also be true of, of mRNA and proteins. And the answer is yes. So let me give you the example of your circadian clock. Now, this is a good day to be talking about the circadian clock. <laughs> All right. um, I really appreciated the extra hour uh, <laughs> last night. Um, but the, what makes you, you know, be active or, and during the day and then go to sleep at night is a set of proteins called the clock proteins. Now these clock proteins appear and disappear with a uh, remarkable regularity every 24 hours. And they are driven, they're, the, the way that the body makes them is you have clock mRNAs that appear and disappear every 24 hours. And you can see in this, in this, uh, this schematic that the clock proteins come up after the mRNA, because the mRNA has to come first and then you make the, the protein. Um, and so one of the other things that's important to know about mRNA is that it is transient. It is not something that is permanent. Uh, it's meant to be transient because as I tell my children when they learn to drive, 
the most important pedal in your car is not the accelerator. <laughs> if you don't have a brake, you have no control. So the only way that we, can, we have to control things is by making things go away. And so mRNA, both mRNA and proteins are transient. The only protein, in, by the way, the only protein in your body that lasts your entire life, does anybody know what it is? It's the chrysalin in the lens of your eye. So this is why you get cataracts and why you should not look at the sun. You cannot replace the chrysalin in the lens of your eye. But every other protein in your body is turning over all the time. It's being replaced with different kinetics. So some last longer than others. And that means that your body's constantly making new mRNAs to make new proteins, and then it's degrading them and rebuilding itself. It's just a constant. Okay. So to, um, here's some data. So this is some data that was from uh, Moderna's uh, S1 filing when Moderna was going public. And this is showing um, delivery of messenger RNA encoding an, a monoclonal antibody against the chikungunya virus. And what I want to just illustrate here is that these are different doses of the mRNA that were given. And you can see that the amount of the protein that got made was, high, was very dose dependent. It was very predictable. And the, ultimately, the protein, because uh, monoclonal antibodies are very uh, long-lived. Uh, once you make that protein, it's a long-lived protein, but ultimately it goes away, right? Here's some more data. This is uh, some data with erythropoietin, that, that, that protein that helps grow new, blood vessels, grow new uh, red blood cells. And what you can see here is the erythropoietin actually has a very short half-life. The protein itself doesn't last very long. And so in this particular experiment, we uh, dosed the animals with uh, mRNA uh, for, for uh, five different times, and, it, and the protein came up and went away. Now you can see that we're getting more and more of the protein over time. If you're looking at the scale, and you might be wondering about that, that doesn't look dose dependent. The problem is, this is active erythropoietin. It was having an effect. It was making more and more red blood cells and blood cells, and it was the blood cells that were making the protein. So, um, th this was a specific, it was showing that the protein is active. So the idea behind mRNA medicines is that if we could simply, instead of delivering a protein, so like a, like a monoclonal antibody, if we could deliver to us the instructions to make the proteins, which you're, normally are coming out of your nucleus anyway, and you have a lot of them in there, but if we could deliver them from the outside, then the ribosomes would be able to uh, recognize the mRNA and make the proteins, and they could make any kind of protein. It could be you know, inside the cell, outside the cell, wherever. And then that opens up the door to a huge number of, of uh, treating a, a huge number of diseases that were not uh, previously uh, tractable. Now, one thing I want to note is viruses. So you recognize this guy, um, SARS-CoV-2, and that's the spike protein. So viruses that infect you are also made of proteins. Guess who makes the proteins for the viruses? You do. The virus does not make the protein. The virus hijacks you it hijacks your protein capacity to make proteins to make proteins for it because it doesn't have these it doesn't have these these factories called ribosomes that can do it and so uh, if you look at, at uh, SARS-CoV-2 and here's a cross section uh, it has um, the the spike protein there's a bunch of other proteins uh, this in here is RNA and uh, coronavirus is an RNA protein. It has a long RNA that encodes lots of different proteins, um, including spike protein. And so the way that uh, Moderna and uh, BioNTech and Pfizer made the vaccine against SARS-CoV-2 was to simply make a messenger RNA outside the body that only contained the instructions to make this protein. And because that messenger RNA only contained those instructions, you cannot get COVID from that vaccine. But it enabled your body to recognize that spike protein and develop an immune response against it. 
So mRNAs can be used to obviously make vaccines, because that's what we're known for now, but they can also be used to make any protein that in the human body. Now, what, are, what about the advantages? What are, what are, what's advantageous about mRNAs? Why should we think about mRNA medicines versus protein medicines? Well, remember I showed you that huge uh, bioreactor that you need a built-in infrastructure uh, it, it's, you know, once you build it, it's, it's a massive thing. You can't move it. Uh, it's very difficult to change out what you're using it for. mRNA medicines are very different because mRNA medicines, it's just code. It's just, it's like uh, computer code. And so when you make a new mRNA medicine, um, all you're doing is you're making a new sequence of mRNA, but everything that's, uh, that, in, that you use in order to make that mRNA is the same, regardless of uh, what, what protein that mRNA is the instructions to make. And so it's easy to make new medicines uh, because you don't have to, um, you, you use all the same raw materials, you're just changing out this sequence. And there's no mammalian cell culture involved. This is the size of the machine. You can see these are on wheels. This is the size of the machine that we used to make clinical batches of vaccine. And this could make about a million uh, vaccine doses. So uh, the scale is much, much smaller. And um, we can use mobile equipment to do that and easily reconfigure them. Uh, and one facility can make many different products, but also it's easy to set up manufacturing all around the world. So there are now uh, mRNA, um, uh, what's so-called GMP manufacturing for good manufacturing practices. The, the, the uh, level of detail that you have to go into to make clinical products now in, on every continent except Antarctica. Um, and you don't need a lot of room. So uh, a, a, uh, a, a GMP facility to make mRNA is, can be smaller than this room. It's, it's really quite remarkable. Um, so the other thing about mRNA medicines is once you've figured out how to make them and how to get them to the right place, so for a vaccine uh, injected into the arm, for a, to treat a metabolic disease, you might need to go intravenously to get to the liver. But once you've figured that out, then it's easy to uh, make a lot of different uh, medicines and get them into to preclinical uh, testing. And so this is uh, the full investigational med medicine pipeline at Moderna uh, for, for the uh, Q3 to, 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 uh, this fall. Uh, it changes all the time, so I had to go back to the, to the website and, and get this. And so what you can see here is that it's all the same technology, right? You have an mRNA, it just encodes different proteins. And here you can see all those different vaccines that are either uh, out there or in clinical trials. Flu is coming along, uh, RSV is coming along, uh, cytomegaly virus, Epstein-Barr virus, which at a university um, care a lot about that because that's mono. Um, and also, um, I care about this is Lyme disease. I, I vaccinate my dogs now against Lyme, but I, there's no Lyme vaccine for people right now. Um, we also have vaccines uh, coming along for cancer, and I didn't want to go over time, so I didn't put those slides in, but if anybody wants to ask me about that uh, a little later, I'm, I can tell you about it. Um, uh, oncology products, so these are cytokines to, to try to heat up uh, tumors to, for the immune system to attack. Um, regenerative medicine, this is VEG A, uh, VEG F, which uh, is involved in create, making new blood vessels. So there are cases where you want, uh, there's times when you might want a patient to grow a new blood vessel. So for example, around diabetic ulcers uh, or during open heart surgery where you're doing a stent and you want that and you can inject the mRNA and, and the instructions to, uh, to tell the body, oh, make a new blood vessel here. Um, I, I could go on and on. Here's a, CFTR is cystic fibrosis, which is one of the most common genetic diseases in the um, uh, um, Caucasian population. And there are, uh, Vertex has uh, many uh, small molecules that can bind to mutant proteins 
uh, for the patients who, who make that protein and they're not functional, but there's about 10% of patients who don't make the protein at all. And so we can give them back the, the mRNA to do that. And then uh, lots of intracellular um, proteins that, for example, these are um, mitochondrial uh, proteins that are missing, that are they're important for, for energy production. Um, you might have heard of PKU, protein uh, phenylketonuria, which is why it says on the back of your Diet Coke, do not drink aspartame because uh, if, you have, if, you're, if, you, if you have PKU, uh, because those patients cannot um, process phenylalanine. Um, so, so it's amazing how quickly you can think about uh, making new drugs. And this is the uh, current um, phase of, the, of the, the drugs that are in clinical trials, and you can see there's just a lot of, uh, lot, lots and lots and lots of vaccines are coming. Many, many more. And one of the things that uh, I think we're most excited about is, I don't know about you, but when I, this fall, when I got my COVID booster, I got the COVID booster in one arm and the flu in the other arm, and and now for older adults, and I hate to admit that I'm one of them, um, we're, you know, the RSV is important, so do I have to get three? Well, we're going to hopefully be making a combined RSV COVID flu, so you just get one shot and you get it all in one. And so that's one of the nice things. Uh, mRNA medicines, you can easily put multiple sequences of mRNA. You're not limited to just one. You can put in multiple ones at a time. Um, uh, a number of other viruses that are problematic, uh, again, rare diseases, oncology, I went through them. But you can see here how far along they are in clinical trials. Okay, so I talked about mRNA. So let's go back to our yin and yang. So um, mRNA is a way to give back the instructions for a missing protein or to give the instructions to your body for a viral protein so that you can make a, um, a, a, an immune response to it, so a vaccine. But what about if you have too much of a protein? What are you going to do about that? So here is another class of RNA medicines that's uh, becoming increasingly important. And that is uh, known as small interfering RNAs, or siRNAs, so RNA interference. So RNA interference was studied, was discovered in uh, 2000 by um, uh, Craig Mello and Andy Fire. Uh, Craig is uh, my colleague at UMass Medical School, um, and he, he and Andy won the Nobel Prize in 2006 for this discovery. And they discovered it by studying worms, nematodes. So this is a really good example of, this is, was biology that we didn't know anything about prior to this. And the people who were doing just basic curiosity-driven research uh, to figure out how things worked found something that turns out to be um, an amazing way to make new medicines. And so this is why, as taxpayers, we should support basic fundamental research because there's still things out there to be discovered that uh, are going to be, be useful. Now, what um, siRNAs are, are short RNA molecules. Instead of these long mRNA molecules, they're short RNA molecules that bind to uh, the mRNA by a double helix, just like DNA. And when they bind to it, they basically just cause the cleavage of the mRNA. And they're very specific, so they'll cleave just the mRNA that they're targeted to. And so um, a company called Onylum, which is the largest company in that space, um, has, has uh, really been working to develop these siRNAs that you can make outside of the body, again, and um, give to the body to then cleave a particular mRNA. And in that way, uh, by cleaving the mRNA, you can uh, eliminate the mRNA, and so therefore you, the, the cells, you, you don't make the protein. Now, one of the, the siRNAs have multiple... Um, uh, advantages as well uh, compared to small molecule medicines or to protein, particularly to protein biologics. So for example, siRNAs you can make by complete chemical synthesis. There's no bio, there's no cell culture involved, there's nothing, it's just chemical synthesis. Uh, they're stable at con controlled temperature. They're actually really good for low resource settings. Uh, like Africa or, or India, where maybe uh, you, you know, there's no cold chain requirement. And they can be delivered by subcutaneous injection. Um, so very, very simple. 
Um, there are already a number of siRNAs that have been approved in the clinic and are in use. Uh, some of them are for rare diseases such as uh, um, patro, um, but others, uh, this one, I don't know, how many of you have seen a commercial for Lecvivo? Lecvivo, yes, I, I have. Um, this is uh, for high cholesterol. So for, the, for patients who take statins um, to control their cholesterol. Now one of the problems with pills uh, is that patients have to remember to take them. And I don't know about you, but I often forget to take my pills. Um, uh, and so that's not good because you really should uh, you know, continually take your, your medicines. Now, this is really cool because here's some data from the New England Journal of Medicine. And this shows that when you um, take Inclicer, whoops, when you take Inclisiran, which is the uh, generic name for Lecvio, um, actually it's a single subcutaneous shot. Now look at this timeline. This is days. So this is a half year out. This is six months out. And the cholesterol is still down. So you can control your cholesterol by taking a single subcutaneous shot one, twice a year, probably at your doctor's office. And then the doctors know that their patients have their cholesterol under control. Uh, and so this is a really a game changer in cholesterol control. Uh, so one of the things about siRNAs is they can be very long lasting, but they still are temporary. Um, and in fact, you can, you can engineer them so they can last uh, longer and shorter times. So siRNAs are another class of RNA medicines. Um, and so uh, siRNAs are the yin to the mRNA yang. All right, now is this it? Is this the only kind of, of mRNA medicines? Um, no, there's a lot more coming uh, because there's all many other kinds of RNA. So I've talked today about siRNAs and I've talked about mRNAs, but there's also tRNAs, which is actually uh, an area that uh, Ohio State is, has a lot of the world's experts in tRNA here. Um, it turns out the ribosome, this, that machine that makes proteins, is mostly composed itself of RNA. Uh, there are small nuclear RNAs, long done coding RNAs, microRNAs, small nuclear RNAs. A recently discovered, uh, we're, we're still discovering new kinds of RNA. Uh, something called glycoRNA was just discovered recently that, that sits on the outside of the cells and, and signals, uh, has important signaling roles in, in cells. So. Um, and we're only starting now to think about how can we uh, utilize these other kinds of RNAs or how can we target these other kinds of RNAs as medicines. And so my prediction is that there's going to be many, many more to come. And with that, I am going to stop and take questions. Um, I think I didn't go as long as I thought I would. Uh, so if, if people want to ask me about the personalized cancer vaccines, I can do that, but I'll wait till somebody asks. So thank you. Okay, so we can, uh, Dr. Moore can take questions and the, the way to do this is to hold up your hand and one of our volunteers will bring a microphone nearby. Go ahead, Corrine. Hi, um, you had mentioned that you can use um, mRNAs, the mRNAs can be delivered to make certain that certain proteins, for example, are created in the body. You had mentioned that sometimes those proteins may need to be needed either in cells or outside of cells. What kind of packaging do you do to make certain the RNA goes to the right place in the body to make certain that those proteins are created in the right area to actually have beneficial outcomes? And then conversely, are there areas where those same good proteins could be made in another part of the body that is actually detrimental? Right. So that's a really good question. And those are some slides I left out because I was afraid I was going to run over on time. Um, so, uh, right. So since Different proteins, different, different cell types in your body make different subsets of proteins. Uh, what you really want is to have, if you're delivering mRNA, uh, you want it to get it to the right cells to make those proteins. And the other problem is, how do you deliver the mRNA? Because I told you, when you eat it, you digest it. Um, 
And so how do you make sure that once you make it, your body doesn't digest it before it gets to where it's supposed to be? Um, and so the way that, that we've solved that is uh, the first, the, the second one, the digestion thing. So how do you stabilize it and get it where it's supposed to be? Is by hiding the mRNA inside a fat ball called a lipid nanoparticle. And so uh, uh, Moderna and other companies have developed um, special fats that, will, that have affinity for RNA and bind to the RNA and coat the RNA. And when we make these lipid nanoparticles, they are very similar to um, uh, lipid transport complexes that your body normally uses to transport fats around the body. So they, they're not uh, strange to the body. Uh, and these lipid transport, these um, lipid nanoparticles can be engineered on the outside to have, to look tasty to different cell types, right? And so dependent on your, your route of administration, so are you doing intermuscular, uh, if you inject intramuscularly in, in your muscles, the, it's not the muscle cells that are taking up the RNA, it's the resident uh, immune cells, the macrophages and monocytes. They will take up the RNA and they're the ones that help give the immune response. If you inject intra intravenously, most things go to the liver. So you, could, you use a different lipid nanoparticle to direct the RNA to the liver. Um, we have also developed um, a, a lipid nanoparticle that can be aerosolized and go into the, and be breathed in in the lungs to treat uh, cystic fibrosis and specifically taken up by the cells that um, uh, want to make cystic fib that excuse me that need to make that particular protein so uh, the lungs of the air the cells of the airway now to to think about this problem of okay how do you with most delivery techniques you don't, normally they have what's called a trophism. They have a tendency to, to go to a particular cell type, but they're not perfect. So how do you keep them out of the cell types that you don't want to? Well, this is one of the really cool things about RNA, because if we go back to here, um, these things called microRNAs are in your cells, and they are negative regulators of RNA, of mRNAs. And so we can build into our mRNA medicines microRNA target sites so that if that mRNA gets into a cell type we don't want it expressed in, the microRNAs in that cell type will kill off that mRNA. Does that make sense? There's, there's a lot of work now going on, and that's what I call an off-logic gate. Uh, there's a lot of work on trying to build on-logic gates where you could only have the mRNA making protein in the cell type that you want. So there's a lot of, of work in that uh, area. Um, for the most part, there are many proteins that it doesn't really matter so much if you are making that protein in cells that normally wouldn't make very much of that protein. So let's say you're trying to make a metabolic enzyme in the liver, but a little bit of it gets made in the spleen. It's not gonna to hurt anything. So um, the, the idea that uh, you might have some toxic protein is, is not generally a problem, but we do a lot of preclinical testing to make sure that we don't have uh, those kind of effects. Does that answer your question? Um, and there's a lot of uh, engineering. I, I think there's gonna be a tremendous amount of, of techno technological innovation in this space in the next five to 10 years. And one of the big technological innovations that's people are working on are these delivery vehicles and how do you, how do you get, I mean, imagine this, that you could uh, solve sickle cell disease by getting mRNAs into hematopoietic stem cells. So you, you know, how do you get the mRNA to there? Um, and so there's a lot of uh, engineering that's going on in that area. Or making, or another, another use is um, CAR T cells. So CAR T cells are used now to fight cancer but normally what they do is they, they harvest the T cells from the patient and they genetically engineer them outside the body and expand them and put them back in. But what if you could just give the mRNA to make that T cell receptor uh, directly to the T cells in the person, then you could just give them a shot and it would, it would be done. And it would also be um, temporary so uh, because the mRNA goes away and then the protein goes away. So you you'd, uh, just keep dosing them because a lot of the problems with CAR T cells are uh, that, that they get back in the body and then they just persist for too long and start doing other bad things. So yeah, 
Okay, so Anita, go ahead. Um, you were talking about the injectable drug that facilitates a uh, high cholesterol. Yeah. I've heard that a lot of the drugs that you get them twice a year, that it might prevent you from getting other drugs, like a cancer drug or something like that. Do you know if that's true or is it? Um, I, so I'm not a, a medical doctor, so I can't speak to that. Okay. Um, and I, so I don't know uh, about that, but, but that would be a, a question for your, for, for the, your, your medical doctor. Sorry. Thanks. So let's go ahead. Amrit, go ahead and fill the question. If you can speak to, into the microphone, I'm not handing it over. Okay. I think you started answering this. I'm not medically inclined, but side effects, adverse side effects. I think your last answer started heading towards that. But I feel I'm resistant. My doctor says, take this. Mm -hmm. But I don't like side effects. And if you watch the evening news, diarrhea and so <laughs> forth, I'm like, who wants to take that? Uh, so side effects, adverse side effects. <laughs> I'm with you. I don't like side effects either. Um, and I know I, I listen to those commercials and I'm, I have exactly the same thing. Like, oh my God, who would ever want to take this? Because you have this litany of things. But, you know, that's all the, the legal ease. Um, the, you know, I think for any medicine, you, there are potentially side effects. And uh, that's why you have, the best thing to do is to be able to titrate it up so that you can start at a low dose and see whether or not you can get to an efficacious dose without uh, potential side effects. Um, there are uh, some side effects of putting lipid nanoparticles in, uh, especially intravenously. Um, they, but they generally can be handled by giving, by pre-dosing with things like ibuprofen and with uh, Benadryl and things like that. But uh, sure, all, all medicines have side effects. Um, this is hard to, to know. Go ahead, Corrine. Yeah. yeah, Melissa over here. Yep. So uh, my question is, can mRNA, well, miRNA and uh, inCRNA, could that be used to slow the production of cancer cells? Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so um, one of the, the uh, let's go back to this slide for a second. Uh, where's my mouse? Um, well, let's talk about personalized cancer vaccines because I did want to talk about that, and I, I did put the slides here. So, um, actually, Moderna has just recently renamed this individualized neoantigen therapy. That really runs off, rolls off the tongue. Um, <laughs> but they didn't want people to confuse it with a vaccine because this is so. This is using your immune system to fight a disease you already have, as opposed to what we normally think of vaccines is preventing you from getting something you don't have yet. Okay, so that's a therapy, it's a therapeutic vaccine as opposed to a preventative vaccine. But the idea is very, is cool. So it turns out that um, cancer is by and large a disease of aging. Um, the, as we get older, the, your incidence of getting cancer goes up. And it's not just that you're accumulating mutations in your cells over time, that's true. But it's also that as you age, your immune system is ramping down. And so you have fewer of your so-called cytotoxic T cells. Um, and those are what recognize inappropriate cells in your body that are uh, either, either pumping out viruses or cancers, and they're keeping cancer at bay. Um, but your body is constantly keeping cancer at bay. So if you... Uh, lack good T cells, you're going to get uh, cancer. And so one of the things that your body does is constantly survey all the cells and ask, is there any protein that's being made by, these, by a cell that shouldn't be here, that I don't recognize? It wasn't here 10 years ago, shouldn't be here. Um, and that's done constantly uh, throughout your lifetime. And so the idea of personalized cancer vaccines is to try to really nudge the immune system to say, hey, here are some proteins that, sh that are in this cancer that shouldn't be there. Pay attention. Um, and so the idea is you take um, a tissue sample from the patient, a, a, a biopsy of their tumor, and uh, you also take a, a sample of their normal blood. 
And then we do this thing called next generation sequencing, which is we do whole genome sequencing of both the tumor and the blood. So the blood is their normal, normal cells, the tumor is their cancer. Now, in most cancers, there are between 10 and 50,000 mutations that are, that are in the tumor. Now, only a few of those are driving the cancer. A lot of them are, are so-called sort of bystander mutations. But some of those mutations will end up being make, giving direct instructions to make proteins that are not quite right. They might have the, the wrong amino acid in one place, right? And, and so um, what we can do, uh, and each person's cancer is unique. So what we do is we um, find those mutations, that are, those so-called neoantigens, the, the mutations where the, it, it makes a change in the protein that is expressed only in the cancer. And then we make uh, RNA that contains up to 34 of those sequences uh, and give it back to the patient. Uh, this is all done within 45 days. It's amazing. This is why Moderna was able to make the first vaccine for COVID in 45 days, because we were already doing this. Um, and so it's just, that's how quick you can make these, these medicines. Um, and what happens is when you give this uh, so-called neoantigen concatamer RNA to the patient, then that mRNA goes in, it makes this peptide chain, which is chopped up by a, the, the, the trash can for proteins called the proteasome, um, into little fragments. And then those fragments get displayed on the cell surface, and they then interact with your T cells to say, hey, these are bad fragments, go look for cancers. And we're doing this in collaboration with Merck um, and using it at the same time as Keytruda. Uh, and this is entering now in phase two clinical trials. Uh, we've got some really exciting data from, uh, mel uh, from melanoma, but there's also other uh, cancers that we're going after. And so this is, is one way that mRNA can be used to uh, fight cancer. Amrit, go ahead. Thank you, phenomenal talk. Um, I wanted to ask about the potential of mRNA in pediatric rare diseases such as muscular dystrophies. For the Moderna COVID vaccine, it was an incredible speed of regulatory uh, framework that enabled it to go from the lab to the clinic. But for current gene therapies, even that preclinical studies take up to two years. Do you see that mRNA-based therapeutics can fill that void and get it quicker to patients where every day is muscle for them? So, so let's pull that apart for a second. So getting it quickly to patients, we can do. We can do this in 45 days. That's, but um, the regulatory process is what takes a long time. And preclinical studies and the regulatory process. Um, the reason that the COVID clinical trials took so quick, went so quickly is because um, you, you, know, you have to do a, a controlled clinical trial where you have placebo, half your subjects get placebo, half get the drug, right? Um, and this, the virus was circulating and people were getting infected by COVID. And so we could easily, very quickly get to the uh, statistical significance of did we have enough people in our control arm, our placebo arm versus our vaccine arm that did or did not get COVID? And that's why it took, it was very quick. But in other trials, it just takes longer because you, you have a longer timeline. This is one of the reasons why neurodegenerative diseases like um, Alzheimer's and uh, Parkinson's, it's so hard to get new drugs because it just takes a long time to do the clinical trials because you have to wait to see as your patient you might have to wait years to see whether the patient has gotten better or not. Um, in terms of muscular dystrophy, mRNA, I don't think itself is going to be a treatment for muscular dystrophy because uh, unless you can get to, uh, it depends on which kind of muscular dystrophy, I suppose. Um, because if you had to get all the muscle cells and you had to get enough of that protein in there or enough of that mRNA into all the muscle cells, I'm not sure it's, it, would, it would work. I think gene therapy is going to be uh, coming along for that. Um, and that's a whole other topic. And mRNA is actually used for that as well, but I didn't have time to talk about that today. Um, but a lot of those, those metabolic disorders, um, uh, especially OTC deficiency, ornithine transcarbamylase deficiency, that is a serious uh, um, uh, pediatric disorder. And, and so that's uh, definitely where that's going. 
You can take a couple more questions. I see I a lot of hands. I'm not allowed to hand notice. Go ahead, Kareem. Oh, okay. Hi, in a recent AARP bulletin, um, they were saying that um, when somebody's developing dementia or, or um, Alzheimer's, that the body was um, fighting, sending things to the brain, but unfortunately were killing the cells around the plaque. But they, they was just a, there was just a large study that showed that people that got vaccines Um, it was helping. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how that's coming along now. Are they in, in trials with that? Um, with mRNA or? I, I don't know the answer to that. And so um, I'd like to, to read that article. Maybe we could find it. But um, there are some really interesting um, effects where you have vaccines for one thing that then affects something else. There's something called trained immunity. It's a whole other area that can be helpful. Um, but speaking of uh, dementia, um, one of the things that's really exciting with siRNA, so again, that's the ability to knock down proteins. So um, Alzheimer's, Lewy body dementia, other types of dementia are often from overexpression of a particular protein in the brain. It's like alpha-seduclein, for example. And there are siRNA therapeutics that are coming, that are coming into clinical trials uh, that will decrease the levels of those proteins. And I think that's particularly exciting. Um, my brother, who's 62, has Lewy body dementia, and I'm desperate to, to get him uh, some kind of treatment for that. So uh, I think that's the way to go. Okay, for, the, for the last question, what we'd like to do is try to prioritize a question from a, a student, a college student, or even better, somebody younger. There's one in the back corner, I think. Kareem, go ahead, and this will be the final question. But we'll definitely have a talk, chance to talk to Dr. Moore at the reception. Hi, um, what are some limitations of RNA treatment? Well, I think the limitation for mRNA um, is it is a uh, relatively fragile molecule. And so um, it does need to be um, stored in a frozen state. And, and if it's left at room temperature for a long time, it's, it's, it's going to, it's not stable. So you can't like leave it on the shelf like a pill. Um, you know, getting into the right cell types. You know, there are many diseases that we'd like to treat, but we can't yet get into that particular cell type. Um, there are other diseases where you may need to um, get a, make a tremendous amount of protein, and we just can't get enough mRNA in there to make that protein. So there are, there are definitely limitations to mRNA therapies, just like anything else. Okay, so before we thank Dr. Moore the final time, I'd like to introduce uh, Professor Dan Schoenberg. Go ahead for a few final remarks. First of all, thank you, Melissa, Ooh. for coming today. Um, Melissa and I have known each other for probably 25 or 30 years. Uh, at, means a lot to me to uh, have such a distinguished colleague come today. Um, so please join me in giving Melissa another round of applause. <laughs> I'd also like to thank my friends and colleagues in the Center for RNA Biology for this recognition. Um, the center really started with about a half a dozen of us uh, and our students getting together each month over a pizza to share the research that is going on in our labs. And that was in the mid 1990s. I never dreamt at that time that we would grow to this size, let alone the degree of impact that RNA research would have uh, on all of our lives. And now a big part of this has been our students and our trainees. Uh, we have a regional meeting that's focused on the trainees. And so we have some of our trainees uh, today have prepared posters that are at the reception. So in closing, I'd like to thank you again and urge you to please come to the reception, meet our students, meet Dr. Moore, myself, and my other colleagues from the Center for our RNA Biology. Thank you very much.